Super nice to see you here at PyCon. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having us. It's uh, strange and exciting to do this live and it to is, see you. Yes, I know. It's Normally so it's cool. uh, so, remote over uh, screen share over half the world or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I've been able to talk with you directly. Also with Samuel here. Like, it's, it's super cool. Super cool yeah, to be yeah. here. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, it's great to be here. It's really fun being at PyCon and then doing this is like, yeah, even more fun. I've done my talk, so I'm much more relaxed than I would have been if it had been this time yesterday. I was just thinking, one, talking to someone else, like one of the best parts about giving a talk is that when it's over, you can really relax. You know what I mean? You're like, okay, now I can enjoy the conference. Absolutely, yeah. And the parties, because you can't go too big on the parties if you got to talk. I feel like they, all the best ones were last night. I feel I'm like... afraid. We were at a pretty good one last <laughs> night, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah. But that was excellent. All right. Well, really good to have you both at the show. I guess you hardly need introductions. Uh, you both are doing such cool work. We had you on the show several times each. So maybe just let's start with a, a catch up. Like you both have lots of big news. Don't want to necessarily spoil too much, but you know, what have you been up to? Yeah. So I raised, raised money earlier this year. Well, it was all sorted last year. Money came in in January this year. Start a company around Pydantic. So I've been busy hiring, got a team of seven now, one more going to join in June. And yeah, currently we're working full-time on Pydantic version two, getting that released. And then after that, we're going to move on to the commercial plans, which I'm not talking about too much, mostly because they're up in the air a bit. Also, because if you start talking about them, you have to finish talking about them. And then that's a, like, I'll just like take over the whole podcast. So I'll, uh, I'll say that, yeah, working on Pydantic V2 for now and then, then moving on soon. Well, first from the whole community, congratulations. You must be really thrilled. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a very surreal, right? Because I, I was going to say, I, I did had, you see this coming? No, I didn't. I had, <laughs> um, I, my plan had been to start a different company once Pydantic V2 was done. And uh -huh. then in November, I, um, uh, uh, Bogomil from Sequoia, who, Sebastian knew. Sebastian recommended he chatted to me. We had a call. We had another call two weeks later. And then he said, let's have the final meeting with like a few more partners to decide whether to invest in two weeks' time. So I thought, oh, I should probably go and speak to some other VCs. So Sebastian very kindly got me lots of intros. My girlfriend also got me some intros. I had like five meetings lined up. And then the like floodgates opened and I got another like 20 or so VCs emailing me being like, please, can I call? <laughs> Starting to hear about, uh, yeah. oh, why are we not part of this? this right. Uh, and wave? Um, yeah. then I got COVID. So I spent a week like, locked in the bedroom upstairs doing VC calls, most of them with the, with the like, camera off, feeling absolutely horrific. And yeah, and then, and then came back full circle, back and had the big, big call with Sequoia and took their money. And they've oh, been amazing. Okay. So it was Sequoia that invested. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. That's, that's a big name to have behind you. So it's Sequoia and Partech, who are a smaller VC, who are like French-American. And then Irregular Expression, which is this really cool CTO network based kind of, again, like New York and, and Paris, mm -hmm. uh, and then a bunch of angels. Yeah. Last time we spoke, it was about Pydantic V2 and then yeah. all of this broke. And yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I'm just back up to, as in, problem was that although I was doing it to speed up, that was there were then two months of yeah. basically doing meetings and doing legals. So I think I've now got a team sufficiently that I'm like caught up to where I would have been if I had just sat there and written code all along. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it goes, right? Yeah. You got to you got to put a little more sand in the gears to 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 grow, I guess. And Sebastian, how about you? What do you What have you been up to? How you been? Oh. I've been good. I've been good. Yeah. <laughs> Very excited about like what they are doing at Pydantic is like and the team they are assembling is like just yeah. amazing. And like yeah, just like recently working a bunch in FastAPI and like mm -hmm. Typer and and actually like in also some of the low level things of fast api and also not just fast api but like the things that go underneath right now like one of the things that i am pushing for is having documentation of the api reference of the reference of the each one of the parameters for what it is for each one of the methods like all the stuff yeah and i want to do it in a in a better way that is more maintainable and that i can test the actual documentation for those parameters and consistency between like there's a bunch of things that I'm trying to do and like it also goes to the low levels of like typing and interacting with the people that is handling typing and like all the stuff that, that is super cool super exciting but like I think it can work and it can it can make these things have like you know like the API reference for the tools is something that a lot of people have been requesting and like being able to have that in a way that is 
easy to maintain that can work well and that I can handle like I think that's that's super exciting on that side and on the other side of course like the integration with Pydantic v2 is super exciting now that they have like the first alpha available is like it is I mean here you are going along working on fast API everyone I talk to is just universally impressed with it you know <laughs> honestly like I've never heard a bad thing about fast API and people are really enjoying it and then here comes Samuel just changing the foundation, changing up Pydantic. Making fast API. Yeah, no, 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 I'm just teasing. And so how much work is that actually going to be to kind of so make actually, the change? Is it kind of nothing or is it some work? No, like the, there will be some work in fast okay. API. The thing is, for final users, it will be like almost transparent. Right. Uh, they will probably, like if they are doing like weird stuff, complex things, like that touches the corner cases of things like that, like they will probably have to update some things. But for most of the use cases, it will be pretty much transparent for people. And right. they will just like get like the, like, I don't know, like 10, 20 X performance from Pydant TV2. And also like the... I was going to say, just on the performance, I'm sorry to interrupt you. One of the big things that we will be able to, you'll be able to drop from FastAPI is the, I'm going to call it hack, but it's not your fault, it's my fault. <laughs> Of like don't the, the don't ask the type problem of of serialization. Yeah. So I think that the like speed up on serialization in Fast API could exceed like you know could be even bigger than that. I don't know that yet, but I like I'm really hopeful for some like massive improvements because of fixes in Pydantic that make Fast API more simpler and more elegant. Yeah. And since they're turning off the lights, we we'll see how long we last here. <laughs> we'll, we'll stay as long as we can. If you hear any noise in the background, that's because they're trying to tear down PyCon, but we're going to... We're tearing we're, down PyCon around us, it seems. We will not let it be torn down. It will live on. <laughs> it's not because of PyDantic V2. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we may have to pause and move, but we'll, we'll find out. Anyway, from a, a user for PyDantic, Samuel, if, if you haven't gone and like deeply gone into like root object validation and all that kind of stuff, it's probably you won't even know, right? So I think the hardest thing, yeah, you're right. The vast majority of your code will either continue to work or we'll have a, <laughs> um, we'll have, <laughs> if you get run over by a forklift, it's going to really slow down the development of Pydantic, by the way. Uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> we're going to have a, a mod tool to, to change the name of methods. So with luck, the vast majority of the changes should be automated. Yeah. I suspect that, and I was saying this earlier in the open space, the hardest thing is probably going to be where your API subtly changes in its restrictions because of effectively edge cases that Pydantic has fixed. Like, so for example, in Pydantic v1, we would coerce a int to a string. If you ever you passed a string to a, an int to a string field, we would coerce it. I think that that's wrong and we shouldn't have done it. And so now we don't. But I was saying in the example, if for some reason you stored your IDs as strings, and therefore your API had the ID field as a string, but your user was just like pumping them into your API as integers because that seemed to make sense to them, right. that's going to break. And you probably haven't got any unit tests that test that because you know your ID field is a string. So I feel sorry for those people. And yeah, my big, biggest like, request would be if you're, if you're a user, try Pydantic v2 as soon as possible. I know if you use it via FastAPI, you, you can't yet, but like all the other libraries. But the sooner you can try it, the sooner you can tell us and the more easily we can fix things and we are prepared to add compatibility shims. Okay, well there, I mean in Python we have sort of a from futures import, well there'd be from a from history import type of like reverse thing to s slow that down or is it going to be a deprecation or is it just... So we're, we're doing deprecation warnings everywhere we can or deprecation yeah. errors saying this has gone away, you probably want to replace it with this thing. We're working really hard on that. We haven't got a like from future import or a, yeah. a or a compat layer yet for actual like validation logic, but if we have to, we will. Yeah. Okay. You'll see, right? See how much screaming. What we didn't want to do was try and guess at what the problems were and build a compatibility layer that people didn't need. Yeah, so of that's course. Why, yeah, why you, are we doing it this way? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You want to go as minimal backwards, trying to to fill those gaps as possible, right? And if I'm brutal about it, if insert name of big bank that use Pydantic locks and never engage with the open source community, get stung by this, <laughs> they never paid me a penny, and they've never engaged, yeah. then like, 
I'm sorry for them, but I'm not as sorry as I would be if they had like come and reported an issue and tried to like help along the way. Yeah, yeah. Like, can we work with you to just like smooth this over? And you know, worst case, pin it. V, you know, equal equal, Pydantic equal equal, one point ten. I think we'll carry on supporting critical security fixes for a year. Okay, uh, so there's something of an LTS type of thing you're thinking. I yeah, mean, not for, too for, LTS, for a while but... we have to, right? For for a while, and yeah, we'll see. Look at the download numbers and, and play it by ear. Yeah. All right. Cool. While we're talking about compatibility, if people are like doing a lot of the the overriding functions and stuff in their Pydantic models, like what do they what should they expect? Too many changes are pretty similar. One of the biggest changes is that the init method of a of a model is now no longer called. Okay. When you're unless you literally call init. So if you call model validate or if your model is nested inside another model, init is no longer called. The solution for that is to use a wrap validator or a, a model validator. But that's going to be one of the like pain points for people. But there's just it turns out with the Rust API, it's literally impossible without a massive performance hit to do that. Yeah, sure, makes sense. Sebastian, you know how's uh. Do you already have a roadmap? Have you already tried the alpha on fast API? Like, what's the story for you guys? So, like, uh, pedantic wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, we have actually been interacting a lot, like, with what are the changes that are needed? Like, what, what is it going to be? And, like, as someone was saying, like, I have a, a lot of uh, code that is quite hacky. Uh -huh. I was actually surprised it, it didn't break much. It just, like, okay. really worked. <laughs> and, like, it's, it's for this particular use case where you can have, like, they are so loud. They really they want are. to tear us down. I know. We, <laughs> yeah, we, might anyway. to, we might have to be here in a second. But let, go ahead. Let's but finish yeah. this thought. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like let, one of those like, concentration uh, challenges. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Validation <laughs> error. Can it concentrate? So imagine this use case where you have user model. And then yeah. this, you want to return this user model. But then you have an authenticated user model, as you were showing in the, in, in the talk, in the, in the PyCon talk. And then this authenticated user model has a field that is a password. If you return that use the authenticated user directly, FastAPI does a lot of tricks to make sure that what you receive in the client side is the actual user without the password. That mm -hmm. is the thing that you declared that you were going to return. But by default, if you don't do it through FastAPI, but you do it with just plain Pydantic, it will just check like, hey, is this an instance of the, the other? And then it will include, include the field. Because, like, you know, because in thinking about types, it makes sense. Like, yeah. oh, this is a subclass of that, so it makes sense that it's valid. But when you think about data in an API, it doesn't make sense that it will include more data than what it should. Right, right, right. Because you, you don't want to either have a mass injection attack on the inbound data or an over yeah, or exposure like, on the way out, give, right? You know, give away the password from users. Is that like, bad? Uh, I think it's pretty bad. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, for example, like uh, some months ago or years or something, like I remember that Kaggle, the Kaggle API was returning like some of the, of the hashes of the experiments. So like, okay. you know, it's like, it's a mistake and a bit very sad that it will could end up just like filtering more data than what it should be returning. And it's something that can happen very easily. It ha can happen very easily to fast API applications if people don't specify what is the response model, that the thing that they want right. to return, and they just return a bunch of data directly. So fast API does a lot of things to make sure that when you declare, declare a response model that should filter the da this data, the data is filtered. But that's a lot of code in fast API to make it compatible. Right. With the new Python TV2, that's going to be pretty much transparent. So that's amazing. That is amazing. There's yeah. going to be like a, a bunch of things that require like some refactoring and also making sure that the Pydantic V1 and V2 are compatible at the same time in some way so that people can have like a migration path. But yeah, like we have been making sure that like all the things that need to be changed or that need to be updated or like all the things that need to be exposed from the Pydantic side are actually available. So yeah, that's awesome that you guys are working so closely together yeah, on this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's going to make it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. in my mind, these two projects are pretty closely tied. I yeah. know that they're not, but that's a big use case. Yeah, I think that's true. And we're like, we know that FastAPI is by far our biggest dependent and so we're but also a Django Ninja which is I think now second or third maybe third after SQL model by stars I is like Vitaly who maintains that has been engaging a lot with awesome. us on, on v2 so yeah lots of other projects are interested in it and I think 
Yeah, lots of people will be able to remove messy code because of that problem. Because, That's yeah, like the invariance of the response interface problem. That's fantastic. Coming back to your, your previous but, question about... Before you go to that, I think we should probably find okay. it. What do you think? Yeah, I think you might be right. Yeah, not even necessarily. I think the audio may be okay, but just for a concentration, it's very loud with the trucks around us. I feel like I'm on the deck of that aircraft carrier. So yeah. I throw things off the yeah, side. Yeah, okay, so. let's... Let's pause this for a moment. We'll be back. Hold on. <laughs> so we have survived the disassembly. <laughs> we have returned to continue. And I think we were talking about the integration of Fast API and Pydantic, and that was really cool. I think something I'd like to kind of move to real quick is this big announcement, alpha of version 2. Samuel, last time you were on the show, we spoke about the plan for version 2. and now. You're at least in an alpha stage. Tell people where we are with this. Yeah, so we're, yeah, we've had two alphas, maybe three alphas now out. We're basically pretty close to a feature freeze. And the yeah. plan is to release the package, release a beta, and effectively, we hope that we can then release the, the full, full release, say, two weeks after that. But there'll be bugs, and we'll fix them, and we'll have more betas. But like, effectively, once we get to beta, the plan is that like, active development is stopping bar fixing bugs. Now it's performance and bugs, right? Yeah, and, and obviously one of the big things will be once that's out, there'll be a lot more work on, say, Fast API, Django Ninja, et cetera, et cetera. And that might come back with, we really need this thing. Either this is broken or we really need that to make it, you know, to reduce the, the overhead of uh, upgrading. One of the things I did for Pydantic 1.10, which was super valuable in beta, was to go through packages with, that use Pydantic Initially sorting by star, but then looking at what they actually do and trying to upgrade them. And that like found me a bunch of bugs in either libraries or in Pydantic. So okay. we're not promising we're going to go and upgrade the whole of GitHub to Pydantic V2, <laughs> but we'll do a bit of that mostly to try and find, yeah, find bugs. One of the things that would be really useful is if anyone has an application that uses Pydantic, preferably without fast API or another library, that they would like help upgrading, we would love to come and help. And it might be a really powerful way of us, again, seeing the real pain points and identifying bugs before we get to V2. Yeah, and I guess another thing to mention that is a real headline, and I also want to get your thoughts on this, Sebastian, is the performance numbers, right? I mean, you, you put out some pretty, pretty impressive performance numbers, and Sebastian gets to piggyback on that, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, I'm, I'm really proud of it, right? I, yeah, I think to I, go in a change of release, in a bump of release to be in the ballpark of 22 times faster, not 22%, but 22 times faster. I don't know of another package that's made an upgrade of that kind of order of magnitude. What's crazy is it's, it's not numerical computing, right? It's general purpose. If you look at the example I gave in my talk earlier, it's a completely standard Pydantic model with four fields. And that's where we're seeing that kind of like 22 times speed up. So I think it's going to be massive. I have my own cynicism about people who hype about performance as being the most important thing. Yeah. I don't think most applications, it's actually the thing that matters most. But I think it matters, A, it matters to everyone and everyone wants it to go in the same direction. And two, it matters to the whole world and to the whole community that we effectively reduce the energy that we, that we consume, like doing compute, basically. Right. That's absolutely true. And also... Even if people don't actually need it, there's a group of people who are like, well, I'm going to leave for Go because it's not fast enough, or I can't do enough concurrency or whatever. And if they don't have that feeling, even if they didn't actually need that percentage increase, that's still really good for the Python community. Even me, I was saying I had a, like a gigabyte of data from Web Analytics that I, was, I needed to load into a Polar's data frame. And for that, I needed to A, extract some attributes from nested fields and B, parse dates and things like that. And I used Pydantic V2. And like, it was, you know, vastly faster with V2. It went yeah, from like awesome. twiddling, twiddling, what's the word I'm looking for? Twiddling your thumbs to, <laughs> um, to, to like, it happens virtually instantly, right? And that's, that's fantastic. Like big, and that'll be, you know, that'll be even more true when you have an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude more data. Yeah, for sure. Sebastian, how about you? Like, what's the knock-on effect for fast API? So I think one of the coolest things is that people won't have to change the code to get that right. performance benefit. It's just going to be like a bump suddenly. And 
because of the new ways that Pydanti can handle the data, we'll, we're going to be able to, there's something that needs to be done in FastAPI, but we're going to be able to let the parsing of the data, let it, let Pydantic handle that in the Rust side. So mm -hmm. Pydantic will be able to just read the JSON bytes instead of reading them in the Python side and let Pydantic do that. And then Pydantic give them the models back to the rest of the code of FastAPI. That alone will boost performance a lot. But the fact that it's being done in Rust, in the Rust side, it's just going to be amazing. Yeah. Like one of the other things that I want to do that is on the plans is to let users define how they want to serialize data and not have like, this is just like by default, it's just like Pydantic models and like it converts automatically to JSON. But I want to allow users to decide how to serialize the objects and the data so that they can this like, like they, data classes or something like that or yeah for example they can okay. say like oh i don't want to serialize with the standard json serializer i want to serialize with or json which is like the mm -hmm. i see rust based implementation uh, to it. serialize json or they can say like i want pydantic to be the one that serializes this because i know that this is just a model that can handle that they can also like and this is one of the things that i think is super cool they can also uh, create they will be able to create a way to say i want to serialize this response to xml or something like that or to yaml and to let pydantic handle the validation but then like do the serialization in a way that they can customize the whole thing without having to do it directly in the code maybe even some of these crazy stream buffer yeah, type yeah, of yeah. Protocols. You know, like yeah, like uh, protocol buffers with protocol, GRPC, it, yeah. or like even message pack, or like you know, like a bunch of these things that there's no obvious way and there's no native way to have support for that for reading the data and for exporting the data. And like that's one of the, the things that I have like in plans. I, like I'm probably yeah. saying too much, and then I'm gonna be accountable. <laughs> and now, you're, now, they're gonna, now they're like, you know what? You promised this. You you did promise it. Well, can I just come back on zero? Yeah, please. For a yeah, minute? yeah, please. Yeah. So what we've I've worked from October, quite uh, like putting to one side the whole funding round in the middle of it, was working solidly on serialization. So we have, there's almost as much code in Pydantic Core now for serialization as there is for validation. Yeah, wow. Well. We can serialize directly to, to JSON using the same underlying library that or JSON uses, using Serdy. But one, and also we can you can customize how your serialization goes on a per field basis rather than on a per type basis, which is like incredibly powerful. But we also allow you to effectively serialize to Python. So not just what used to be the dict method, but basically do JSONable Python. So you effectively set the mode when serializing to Python to JSON, and you'll only get the like, whatever it is, seven primitive JSON types in Python, which is super valuable if you want your output to be XML, because then you know your XML encoder only needs to bother needs to take in dictionaries, list, ints, floats, none, bool. Yeah. <laughs> um, rather than whatever complex data you have. So there's an or I, yeah, I'm like super proud of lots of the advantages of serialization. My 45 minute talk earlier, I was able to touch about half of the the big new features, which kind of so talks about quite how much has changed. Yeah, that's really exciting. I think we definitely. I was saying earlier, I, if I had known how long it was going to take, I would never have set out on this journey. So the, <laughs> the best thing about it is I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think about how long it was going to take because we didn't try and do a bit more. We tried to do everything, or I tried to do everything. Mm -hmm. And that's had but, its disadvantages. It's taken longer than we had hoped. But, but here, here are. you are. You're pretty much here. That's really good. That's really good. And so when you think about performance, right? obviously the 22 times faster is awesome. The fast API speed up is awesome. But if you do something like SQL model, and fast API or Beanie and fast API, you're getting on both ends, you're getting that Beanie or the Pydantic benefits with the BD integration and the fast. So you, you're kind of putting Pydantic in both those layers. And so those speed ups are like twice as good or something like that. Yeah. Right. I think you, uh, well, they're probably, yeah, they're like, they're the same relatively, but more in absolute terms. As yeah. In, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, the fact that so many things have been built t upon Pydantic means you've just sped up a bunch of projects without them doing too much. Yeah, we get the, like, the win. It's like CPython itself getting faster helps everyone. This is like the next layer down. But, we, you know, as a dependency of lots of packages, we get to speed up lots of the community with one package, like one person <laughs> devoting a year to it. <laughs>
<laughs> Does this surprise you to see all these projects coming out? Like, here's another project based on Pydantic Plus, you know, name your other thing that it's integrating It's been with. crazy, particularly in the, like, machine learning space where, you know, Langchain, who are one of the, like, big names right now in uh, these, like, big language models, uh, large language models, all based on Pydantic, right? Yeah. You were saying, I think, on Twitter that OpenAPI use a bunch of fast API, right? OpenAI. Uh, so, sorry, what? Yeah, OpenAI, not OpenAPI. <laughs> uh, Marvin from, I think, from Prefect is, is built on Pydantic again. So like the, the wave of machine learning stuff seems to have leveraged Pydantic a whole lot. Dockeray being another, another big example. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Some for Elastic and some other things as well. So coming back to you, Sebastian, you know, I'm sure one of the big things you're thinking going forward with fast API is like, how do you guys work together and make this a seamless change? What else you got? What else are you working on? What, what else do you see in the future? I have a bunch of things. Uh, so, like, are they secret or can you tell it? No, no, I, I can tell. Okay, uh, <laughs> most of it I can tell. I, I just feel, I just feel the, <laughs> feel the accountability. But, <laughs> but I can tell. So, like, I have a bunch of projects, and like, the funny thing is that, in some way, it's kind of a dependency graph of things that I should work on. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I have this project generator for FastAPI to generate a project with a SQL database. I haven't updated it in a long time and it uses SQL Alchemy. I built SQL model for that project to use it there, but I haven't updated it there because first I want to upgrade more things in SQL model. I want to finish the documentation, finish the story about migration, but then for the story about migration, I need Typer for SQL model. So I need to update <laughs> things in Typer. And then for Typer, I want to add support for annotated, which is actually one of the big yeah. things, one of the recent big things in FastAPI is that now there's support for annotated. So annotated this feature from Python is like standard Python typings. You import from typing, from typings import annotated, and then you can use that to meta information to the types that you define for parameters. and Like stuff. what? I haven't used this. I love typing. I use it all the time. And I'm, so, here I'm learning more about the, typing. The thing is, it exists there in the standard library, but it doesn't have like a canonical use in Python itself. It's there mainly for, for fast API and Pydantic to use it. <laughs> you know, like it's just that like I haven't I hadn't pushed for that before. But the thing is, you import from typings, import uh, annotated, and then you create a function that takes like a, a username, and then th this function will normally be of type string. So it will be like, the parameter of the function will be username colon str. Now you can say username colon annotated. And then open square brackets as if it was like a list or like mm -hmm. a dict or something. Open square brackets. And then the first thing that you put there, that's the actual type. So you will say annotated string. Uh, okay. And then you can pass additional metadata afterwards. And the additional metadata is the thing that you will t use to tell FastAPI. This should be extracted from the query parameters or from the cookies or from headers. Before, and like up to recently in FastAPI, the only way to do that was using the default value of the parameter. Right, you would set the default to like a depends or... Yeah, to depends or equals a cookie or yeah, equals right. header or something like that. And then FastAPI can take the information from that to give you the data in your function. But the thing is, if you call that function manually somewhere else, the editor and Python won't complain that you are not passing some parameter that is required. Right, and then you're right. going to end up with some strange value internally that is just for fast API. Right. Or, or the type checker complains, you're yeah. not passing a depends. Like, no, I'm passing a string. That's what it's supposed to be. But that's yeah, some exactly. kind of weird thing. Like exactly. That. Yeah, okay. So for those cases, having annotated, like all the type is exactly what it is. And if it has a default value, is the actual default value instead of like some, some strange uh, internal concept in fast API. Mm -hmm. And having support for that allows having like much better support for typings for editors auto completion in layers all these things reusing the same functions in other places and it will also having support for that in typer will allow users to have the same function being used for fast api and typer having the custom metadata necessary for each one of the parameters for fast api and for typer and things like that so it's uh, something okay. that is super powerful and super interesting uh, yeah. I'm going to come in on annotated because I'm excited about it too. <laughs> so Pydantic v2, we use annotated for all of our custom types. So for example, positive int type is just annotated of int. And then we use the annotated types package, which is some reusable metadata for annotated. Um, so we would use the, uh, like positive int is annotated of int and then greater than zero. And what's even cooler is that will be used by, by Pydantic, of course. 
uh, hypothesis is going to get support for okay. that really soon. So it will only pass a positive value in if it sees greater than zero there. And then typer, I guess, could like even if it's still based on click, it can go and take that greater than yeah. and infer it as you know must be greater than zero. So I think it was one of the things that typing guys when they first created annotated hoped was going to build a, a rich network of of libraries that interchanged metadata. It's taken a bit longer than they expected, but we're getting there. I hear the two of you are <laughs> kind of doing that a little bit, right? That's cool. That's really cool. One of the areas where I feel like typing is a little janky is on ORMs and ODMs, when you define a class, you say, for example, it's like a SQL alchemy column or it's, it's a, a beanie column or something like that. And the type is it's a, or, you know, a string column, but really yeah. it's a string. It's not a string column. And so there's this weirdness of using types to kind of drive behavior. That's a perfect case for using annotated. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Is what it? it doesn't do is the other case where there is a context where you'd want to get, get the column object of some sort rather than the integer in a row. So it, it does mean two different things, the kind of dot objects in the Django context, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's there precisely to solve this kind of problem. And it's also because like currently, as far as I remember, there's no way. So the, the thing is that this is all based on something called descriptors. And is that the when you call like, I don't know, class user dot name, it's actually the attribute in the class. But when you create an instance of that user and then say user dot name, that is the attribute on the actual instance. And the way that these ODMs or ORMs or these things work is that they have a special way to say like, when someone calls the actual class, this is a different thing than when someone calls an instance attribute right and there's it's sort of two behaviors yeah depending on the yeah context, and like right? it's super powerful that's how sql alchemy works and it's super powerful because then like all the queries and all the stuff is actually like uh, consistent with how python works and you can say like greater than or equals to using python syntax mm -hmm. which is great but then currently as far as i know there's no way to define that with type annotations in a standard way i think it's something that will probably be improvable but I think there's currently no way. There will probably be a way at some point. But to be able to say like, hey, this equal alchemy column is a column when it's accessed at the class level, but this is going to be a string when it's accessed at the, at the yeah, like instance a, level. A scope level in the annotated, you know, yeah, yeah, the yeah, class, yeah. So, something this like and this, and yeah. it's the instance is that and that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, while we're talking types, and I know you both are really big fans because it's such a central part, both your libraries. What do you want to see Coming. It feels like this is an area of Python changing fast, but is there something like I, they just, if they could just? And I have another question on types, by the way, after that, if I remember. So I gave a talk at the Typing Summit asking for certain things. So now we're going to test my Can I Remember Pep Numbers challenge, which I'm going to fail in, but Pep472 is that keyword args to. So one option would be to allow keyword arguments to get item which would make annotated even more powerful because then you could use keyword arguments to describe the meaning of your metadata rather than having to have these kind of identifier types like greater than. One of the big things that I, I hope we're going to persuade, so I think one of the things that's happened recently is that everyone gets that runtime use of type hints is a legitimate thing. They might not want to do it themselves, but they get that like it's a legitimate thing to do. How, how much pushback was there when you first came out with Pytangic there? Uh, I are think you... we were like the black sheep of Python. No, I was a black sheep of Python. Oh, wow. This is supposed to have no meaning. What are you doing? You're right. doing it wrong. Okay. And I think nowadays that, that, that's changed and everyone gets it's a real thing. But So for example, the hash of a union is independent of the order of the members of the union. That makes sense in the context of static typing where the union of int float is exactly the same as the union of float int. It turns out in static typing, particularly when you're doing coercion, there are some cases where that is not the case. And so it's really difficult right now that effectively when you, unions are fine on their own, but if you have a union, say, within a string, the capital string, square brackets, it will, the order will be match the order that the first time you call that, not what you actually call, unless you use lowercase string when it is the right order, except there's a PR open right now to, to break it on string two. So yeah. string as well. So anyway, we are um, on lowercase list as well. Um, anyway, so, so things like that, where I, I do think that like, we'll see what happens on that particular case, but I feel like the, 
like the voice of people doing runtime use of types, we're not the only people, are being heard better. And like, yeah, I think things are going to like continue to improve. Yeah, there was a pep that proposed an optimization for typing that kind of broke the runtime behaviors of it a little bit for both of y'all. Yeah, it did in, very, in some edge cases. Yeah, and right. that's going to be going to be fixed soon by the successor pep. Absolutely. So that, that's really good. Generic alias is another thing that like kills us internally in Pydantic. I won't go into all of the details of it, but yeah, we would, it, it seemed what the, the, the high level takeaway is that the typing community seemed happy with the idea that they might make a change to typing to make it easier for us. And I think that's also for, for the Pydantic team to engage better. And instead of spending ages, the problem is, right? Like you have a problem, you see a, a solution in typing, you submit the PR, even if it gets accepted in a week, which it won't, you wait five years before we can remove the code that, that deals with the other case. So it's very tempting not to engage with typing, but just go and write the work around where we should be better Python citizens and go and submit the PR to see Python to try and fix it properly. Yeah, what's your wish list for typing? <laughs> so, well, the first thing is like this thing that I have been trying to work on and like trying to do to have like better ways to do the documentation of the APIs mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. also related to typing and to, to the annotations. Like, let's see if I can pull it off. The, the other thing is like, it's actually not that necessarily that related to the things that we have been talking about, but it's quite relevant for the data science and machine learning community. That is that there are many, many APIs for many libraries that decorate in some way some function. And then the function is expected to give some types of values to the body of the function internally, but to, to be able to receive different types of values. That sounds a bit abstract, but like that's, that's the core idea that is like replicated across several libraries. And this will apply to, for example, to Ray, the distributed machine learning or computing system, to Dask. To, I think Daxter also uses something like that. Monad, this system for deploying uh, workloads and machine learning and things like that, also uses these types of ideas. Mm -hmm. So there are many of these libraries that like the way that they are designed is that you create some function and then you are going to tell something to call this function. And then in the function, you say, I want to expect this value. And instead of you calling all the functions that will generate that value, you tell it like, hey, distributed system, blah, blah, blah. Give me this value, execute this for me. But that means that you will have or no type annotations or invalid type annotations or red squiggly lines in some places or no auto-completion or auto-completion for the wrong things just because there's currently no way to define this specific thing of saying, hey, this function after being decorated is going to be able to receive a different type oh, yeah. than what it's going to give to internal. So I think that's something that, and it's probably quite challenging and like a, a big thing to tackle, but it's something that is replicated across several libraries, in particular for these things that they do distributed processing of uh, data. I think that's something that will be, that will be great to improve. Does, yeah. does Paramspec fix, fix some of that or? It's very close, but the Paramspec only does it for, the Paramspec only does it for being able to sort of copy the params that come from one function to another. And actually I use all that for, for example, for asynker and for other things to be able to, uh, to get like auto-completion for the decorated function or for the generated function or things like that. And, and it will probably, like the, the change will probably be somewhere around Paramspec to be able to say like, not just the Paramspec, but like this function it will not only have the pan spec, but will receive a modification like yeah. this of the parameters. Almost making param spec generic. <laughs> 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 All right. One more typing question. Do you all think typing is going too far with like the generic stuff? And is it going too much like C++ and C Sharp and Java? Or is it, is it still, still good? I, I think it's, I think the way Python is growing is super interesting because yeah. like, we all have to agree that Python 3.12 is not the same Python 2.7. Yeah. It's, it's quite different. And I think it's a different in a good way. The users are different and the, light, the, the focus of the, yeah, light, yeah, of the absolutely. runtime is different. Yeah. And like the things that we can do with types now and like the fact that in Python we can access these types at runtime, which means like, I don't know, I, I was always confused with the term runtime. It's like, what does that mean? And it's like when you execute Python, the same Python code 
can inspect and like see what are those types. That's what FastAPI and Pydantic do. It's yeah. just like seeing like what are those types. We can do that in Python. You cannot do that in things like uh, TypeScript or you cannot do it in Java. You cannot do it in many other languages. You get access to this typing information to be able to do additional things with that like validation, data serialization, documentation, all that stuff. So I think that's to start that's super powerful in Python. The, the, the language in Python for typings is not as powerful as, for example, TypeScript. There is just like so much stuff that you can do with that. <laughs> Nevertheless, I feel that in Python is just like, is growing and is growing organically. And like we have growing pains, you know, like there are some things that it's like, oh, this, this little thing here is, is slightly incorrectly named, yeah. but like, now there's a better way to do that in Python 3.10, so we don't care much about that in slightly incorrect name, things like that. Yeah, I feel like there's some tensions of people who are on the MyPy side, and they want perfect validation of, I want to prove my code hangs together like a static compiler. And folks like you all who are like, we want to leverage typing to make it behave in interesting ways. And maybe that behavior expression doesn't exactly match what it looks statically like, but it it is everybody wants it, but it's it's might trip up my pie, and I feel like there's this tension between those two things. That's kind of what I was thinking when I asked that I question. I think that there's a little bit of that, but at the same time, there's is much less than you could imagine. There are mm. so many people that are so close to you know core my pie and these things that are actually very excited about the things that we are doing. So yeah, they're like you know like the, it's actually quite friendly, all the communication. It's just that there is some people that just don't really care about runtime types and that's fine. But like, I feel like it's much more, you know, much more closer together and like much more stronger the relationship, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I, I think actually we've gone in the, we've, typing's got better for someone who's not, like it's actually got less verbose, cleaner, easier to understand. You don't have to import union. You can do pipe operator. You don't right. have to import list from typing. You can use list, which makes complete sense. Any is an unfortunate one, but I also understand why the any function might, it would not make sense. Yeah, so I, give up. I, I, just, I can't deal with this part. So yeah. <laughs> um, no, in general, I think it's got much better. I do think that the interchange between runtime, the, so there's a pep open now to add to data class transforms a converter function. I forget exactly how it works, but I think that is awareness in the static typing space that, that data gets converted when you construct something that looks like a data class. So um, no, I think, I think it's really positive. I think we're incredibly lucky that we're like, I could say TypeScript is the other, is in some ways the best untyped language typing system. Yeah. But the fact that they're not available at runtime means we're, we're killing it, I think. I spoke yeah. to someone who maintains a library that does uh, type analysis at runtime in TypeScript, and all his types are strings. And like they're valid TypeScript, but they're strings. And that's, you know, he was saying that doesn't matter and it's all fine. I tend to feel like it probably <laughs> does a bit. We're really lucky to, to have them at runtime. Then you go to the other end where I've been writing a lot of Rust. I am like Rust great, it has many advantages, but if you want to just get something done and not have to think too hard about what the types are, it's really nice. I write a lot of Python that's untyped when I'm just trying to get something to, something to work. I'm not a like, everything must have a type on it kind of person. So no, I think we're in a really great place. And I think most of the advantages are actually cleaning it up. So the new six something, 649, the new generics syntax, to me, 695. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the there are two types of people stuff. in the yeah. world. There are people who know the names of their numbers of their peps, and, uh, <laughs> and there's everyone, everyone sane. Uh, <laughs> I that for me cleans up generics, right? Yes, it's a fundamental change to the language. Yes, it makes the syntax of a function look a bit more like Rust or something. But like, if you look at it independently of our experience, it's a heck of a lot more elegant than importing typefar. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me ask you one. That's there's a period purely theoretical, because I don't think it'll get adopted, but we have int pipe none, we have optional of int. A lot of languages have question mark for nullable types, like it'd be int. You could even say it like int? I'm not <laughs> sure. Is it an int? It could be an int. It might be nullable. I don't know, right? Or use int as an int, you just know. There's no question mark. And those types, of, what are your all thoughts about like null coalescing, you don't care? I'm really, I'm really happy with the new situation and, and not having the optional that isn't optional. 
that's been a problem for a long time. So not needing to use optional is, a, is a, being able to use pipe none is great. I, I actually think one of the things that's going to happen, with, particularly with the advent of the match syntax and with increased use of type dict, we're going to need a new union type that operates much more like an enum in Rust. So basically a union that keeps track of which member of the enum you have an instance of. I keep meaning to build a like, package to demonstrate what I mean, and I haven't got around to it, but like, <laughs> if you have a union <laughs> of busy. lots of type dicts, which is a legitimate <laughs> thing to do, it's effectively impossible without starting to do effectively validation to work out which member you're on. So I think we need, and it would be really neat if you could use a match expression to process each branch of your union. Sebastian? You already said everything. <laughs> <laughs> No, but like, you know, like I feel, I feel that way. I was saying that like, I feel Python is just like growing and like the typing system is, is growing. I feel it's growing in a very healthy way because it's not, you know, it's not like just some, some, some academics hidden in some corners somewhere saying like, this is how it should be I did be my done. thesis on, on this type yeah, system and yeah. here we and are. And then like yeah, everyone yeah. should just use it. It's just like a lot of hearing everyone and just mm. receiving the feedback from everyone and just like yeah, growing great. in the ways that it should grow i think that's amazing i think like we are you know it's like a kind of renaissance day of, of like typing in python and like how we can build all these things i think yeah. that's amazing i think it absolutely is all right i think we're pretty much out of time we've used up all the various places we've escaped to at a shutting down conference here final question for you both just you know what's your big takeaway what's the experience like here at pycon like how's, how's it been 2023 for me, it's, it's been amazing. It's my first PyCon in the US. Oh, it is? Yeah, okay. like I have yeah. never been in a PyCon in the US. I have been in PyCons in like many other places, but not in the US. Mm -hmm. And like I got, to see, I got to put faces to so many handles in Twitter and GitHub. I got to meet you <laughs> in yeah, person. Yeah, That's yeah. amazing. Wow, it's great. And like a, a bunch of other people that, that I only knew, you know, just like mm -hmm. on the internet, a bunch of core developers. And like, That's so cool. They are so cool. Like I knew they were super cool, but just like, you know, talking on Twitter and like yeah. then seeing him in person, that's, that's uh, amazing. It really, that's my favorite part of the whole conference. It's just the, the people and the getting, getting together. Definitely. I, I, think, I think I attended like two talks. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was yeah, just yeah. on the hallway so talking you, to you, everyone. You feel the hallway track. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I was all the way on okay. the hallway track. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. I remember Sebastian and I joined the Language Summit remotely two years ago, the year when there was no PyCon. And the most interesting bit of the like four hour Zoom call was the five minutes between talks when people just chatted. And I yeah. remember then thinking how cool PyCon must be to have that same group of people like in a room rather than on a Zoom call. So um, no, I love it. I think it's, uh, I really enjoyed it. I, last year was my first year. This year's even more fun. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoy it. Awesome. Yeah, it's been great to meet you both in Obviously person. Meeting you has been the best bit Oh, of thank you very much. No, no, it's been really great to spend some time with you all here. And thanks for coming on the podcast, uh, part two now here to, to wrap things up. So it's, thanks for taking the time and congrats both on the success of your projects. They're, they're amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. And thanks for seeing us. Yeah, bye guys. <laughs>